Okay, thanks everybody for coming back. Um, my name is Matt Wood, I'm from the University of Gloucestershire, and I'm more on the, the seabird side, and I'm talking later on, so more about how I fit into the aged family tree of things around here. But enough of uh, modeling ornithologists. Uh, this session is more about the things that happen under the water and the things that really prop up the kind of uh, marine ecosystems on which the seabirds depend. So we have two uh, speakers, and the first is then is uh, Phil Newman, who uh, works with the Marine Net, Net, uh, Marine Text Reserve around uh, Scope Island. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity to talk about some of the wet stuff. Um, for those of you who know me, this won't be my normal diet, try by promise. I'll try and tone it down a little bit. But uh, on behalf of the, the small team that work at the Scope Marine Net Reserve, employed by Natural Resources Wales now, um, I thought I'd just try and illustrate the fact that there is other, other things in the marine environment other than the birds. And of course, this is the normal sort of view that anybody coming to Scone will get of it. But our argument would be that uh, that view actually misses at least 50% of uh, the environment that should be important to us. So not just in terms of the landscape, there's a whole landscape, landscape hidden away you know, beneath that rather uh, grotty water that we tend to experience more, more often than not around the Welsh coast. But also in terms of the amazing diversity of the habitats and species that live below the water. Some very weird and wonderful communities that live attached to the seabed. Um, some of them, for example, this turf which consists almost entirely of colonial animals barely a plant in that photograph at all, despite the appearances. <clears throat> and of course, you can't get away with mentioning without mentioning the scoma, without mentioning the puffins, because that's what, as Mike said, everybody comes to scoma to look at. How many visitors to scoma would even know what sort of beast this is? Let alone the fact that uh, at our tiny little marine nature reserve around scoma, we have over two-thirds of all the species of sea slug, because that's what this is, represented in that little one patch. And fortunately for me, I decided to shy away from looking at the long-term data for, uh, for seals, as Mike's already covered that. Um, besides which, they're far too photogenic and charismatic for me. I'd much prefer the things that people go, what's that, and why are you talking about it? So I should be talking about uh, just a very small number of the, the monitoring projects that we carry out at SCOMA, uh, starting with something which is really not very charismatic at all, is grass, basically. But it grows on the seabed, which is pretty unusual. But it's probably more important in terms of the general ecology uh, than the seals themselves, because it's such an incredibly important habitat in its own right. In its own right. Uh, it's a habitat action plan species, uh, so it has certain sort of protections coming with it. Uh, but it's also incredibly important refuge habitat uh, for all sorts of plants and animals, uh, including juvenile fish and shellfish species. Uh, now at SCOMA, of course, where have we got our wonderfully uh, precious eelgrass bed? right underneath where all the visitors come to look at puffins. But we don't begrudge them that fact. You know, they're coming to see the wildlife in all its uh, various guises at Skomer Island. So it's our job, as Mike was saying earlier, to manage that visitor experience so that they're not damaging some of the uh, features of the marine nature reserve that they just won't clap eyes on. So, what we do is try and encourage them to the right areas by dissuading them from dropping great big hooks in our eelgrass bed. Eelgrass being quite unusual, but it's a flowering plant rather than a seaweed. So it has a whole system of roots and rhizomes uh, below the seabed, which really don't take kindly to having hooks dragged through them, including both anchors. So we mark, mark out the area of the eelgrass itself uh, with nice big colorful boys, which Mike loves. Um, but we also make it a lot easier for people to enjoy the whole experience by providing facilities such as visitor moorings. So they can pick up a visitor mooring 
without damaging uh, the feature of the brain neck reserve that they may be blissfully unaware of. <coughs> now, in terms of what kind of effect that's had on the population of veal grass, the management we're carrying out to, to actually uh, manage the visitors, um, whether or not that's having a beneficial effect or not depends on what are now called our citizen scientists, or volunteers as we used to call them. Um, in terms of getting a lot of robust uh, and plentiful data on the oak grass bed at the bottom of North Haven, we depend on gangs of volunteer divers rather than trying to do all the work ourselves. We're able to encourage uh, volunteer divers to come out and count grass uh, sprouts on the seabed for hours and hours on end. <coughs> no mean feat in itself, but what we do get out of that is an incredibly good data set very, very detailed data set. And what that enables us to do, starting with the first uh, surveys that we did with volunteer divers back in 1997, is actually map out the eel, eel grass bed in terms of its density and its extent, because the detail of the data is there, just through having that many people engaged in the work. Now we get some comfort that we're actually doing the right thing if we can actually track the density of the eelgrass and its extent. Every four or five years when we send our ever willing divers back down to the seabed to count the grass again, and we can see that it's not doing too badly. <coughs> by the intense red colours where the most dense parts of the eelgrass bed are, and also the fact that the, the uh, boundary itself has extended somewhat. It's constrained physically, but uh, within those constraints, it's doing quite well. Now, the advantage of having longer term data sets is the fact that when we come to a slightly stranger looking here, there's obviously a natural dynamic in the real grass bed, which causes certain parts of it to decrease in density and other parts to increase. So we're going to have that natural noise, or at least we hope it's natural by our management remove one of the potential impacts at least. So we need to continue looking at that into the future in order to realise what the natural variation is of that population. But at the moment, we're getting the indication that we're doing the right stuff, which is important from the management point of view. What's important about this data set in a much wider context is that Natural Resources Wales also has the responsibility for monitoring eelgrass beds on a far wider basis throughout Wales uh, in order to comply with the reporting on the European Water Framework Directive. Now, having all these eelgrass beds to try and map out, obviously we're going to look down the technological route to try and do it in a, in a quick and efficient sort of manner. Now, technology is all very well, but unless you can ground truth it, uh, and calibrate it properly, uh, it's very difficult to do. And in order to, to effectively ground truth and calibrate your uh, technology, you have to put in an awful lot of resource. Now, we're very fortunate that we have already got that resource. So we're working closely with our colleagues from the uh, fisheries assessment team, with all their expensive pieces of equipment, looking at a sonar profile of the eelgrass bed that they can perhaps export to 